This episode is brought to you by the Bell & Blank Center at the University of Iowa at bellandblank.org with programs and resources to support neurodivergent students and their families. A lot of times adults and well-intentioned parents try to reassure their kids. And really what kids need is validation rather than reassurance because you as their parent, you can't be there all the time to let them know it's going to work out. And frankly, you don't know that it's going to work out. What we want to do instead is to validate Yes, you know what? It makes sense that you're afraid on the first day of school. Lots of kids are. Supporting ADHD kids is tricky. Whether they fall under the predominantly inattentive type, the mostly hyperactive type, or have a mix of both, finding strategies that can support them can feel like a never-ending hamster wheel for their parents and teachers. Continuing our series for ADHD Awareness Month, today's guest is going to help us come up with some ideas to support ADHD or kids and teens. Clinical psychologist Dr. Sharon Celine is with us today. That's straight ahead on episode 142. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Our guest, Sharon Celine, is the author of What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, Working Together to Empower Kids for Success in School and Life. But before we get into that conversation, I want to take an opportunity to invite you over to our Facebook group, the Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group. If you heard our recent AMA episode, all of the questions came from individuals in that group. We have other opportunities to connect and support each other and would love for you to join us. Of course, if you aren't on Facebook, you can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We'd love to connect with you online wherever you'd like to hang out. Okay, then, my conversation with Dr. Sharon Celine is up next. Previously on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Practical intelligence and emotional intelligence. You also mentioned some brain training programs. Why are we clinging on to those concepts? That's another book. <laughs> Uh, I haven't written that book yet. I think one of the big reasons is that psychology has not done a very good job at disseminating this information. But I did a study where I examined intro to psychology textbooks and over three quarters of them had some of these, these misconceptions. And I quoted some of those in the book. If we can't even get our own textbooks right, how on earth should we expect lay people who haven't studied this for a living to get it right? And so I don't really blame society. I blame psychology more than, than anyone else. <laughs> That's episode 69. Look for it in your favorite podcast app. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Sharon Celine, author of What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, Working Together to Empower Kids for Success in School and Life. So Sharon, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I've been looking forward to this for sure. So I think to start off, I know a lot of people have an awareness of ADHD, but Maybe if you can just give us a bit of insight into some of the different characteristics we might see in ADHD kids, just so we all kind of are on the same page with that as we start off. So we know that ADHD is a biologically based condition. It's largely hereditary, but not exclusively. Around 55% of kids with ADHD have at least one parent who has ADHD even if they are not necessarily aware of it. <laughs> you know, signs of ADHD would be impulsivity, hyperactivity. It could also be inattentiveness, uh, kind of dreamy, a quality, a lack of focus. Uh, we can also see, particularly in girls, um, social issues. And we see these in boys, too, difficulty making and maintaining friendships, impulse control, uh, challenges, emotional dysregulation, as well as Issues with memory and follow through and being able to kind of stick with something, even if it's unpleasant. Because one of the things that happens for all people with ADHD is that they have lower amounts of dopamine and norepinephrine in their brains. And those are two pretty important uh, neurotransmitters. Dopamine has to do with 
pleasure and reward and interest and satisfaction. And norepinephrine has to do with you know, concentration and sleep. And so we'll see, particularly in the dopamine pathways in the brain, that there's either less activity or there's there's just a kind of unusual activity. You know, it depends on everyone's brain is a little bit different. And so this is why people take medication. They may choose to or not, but they often take medication to assist with uh, the neurotransmitters who are like the fairies of, of, of the brain. They basically take a message from one neuron to another across the synapse, which is like a river. So it's like a fairy crossing. And um, in people with ADHD, sometimes those fairies just, there's not enough of them. Sometimes they run too slowly. Sometimes they run too quickly. They pick up the message and they take and they deliver it when it actually needs to hang out in the river a little bit. And so everybody's brain is different. I think that's one of the things that is hard to overcome. And that is the the stigma about ADHD because it looks like, from an external point of view, a lack of effort or a lack of caring. And if you just tried harder, you know, then things would be okay. And that's the message that a lot of ADHDers get quite a bit, which is inaccurate. It's completely inaccurate because the dopamine pathways have a lot of connections to the prefrontal cortex. So if you're listening, you take your hand and you put it on your forehead and you say, what were you thinking? Or, oh my goodness, or in my culture, oy vey. Um, that's the part of the brain behind your hand, behind your forehead, that is the prefrontal cortex. And it's um, responsible for executing tasks. So that's where the executive functioning skills, really, that term comes from. And uh, there's a lot of connection through the dopamine and the norepinephrine pathways to the prefrontal cortex. And there's also sometimes some structural differences in people's brains with ADHD. So when adults um, and sadly, parents um, think of their kids as just not trying hard enough. Like you can play, you can play your video game for you know two hours and be fine and concentrate. But you know, when I ask you to rake the yard, you can only do it for five minutes. And I would say, well, of course, that's because the the games are a high dopamine activity. There's a lot of reward and satisfaction and stimulation, and raking the yard is a low dopamine. <laughs> frankly, boring activity where I can't even see the results. And if I do make a big pile of leaves, I want to jump into that, which will undo my work. So, you know, today I was talking with someone who I, um, I do some supervision and, you know, she was telling me about this boy who's in high school and his parents are so down on him, you know, and he's not done well. He's very bright, but he's low grades and he's, you know, becoming a senior. And, you know, he doesn't really trust adults, and he she's trying hard to make a connection, um, but it's it's very challenging, um, partially because the message he gets is like something's wrong with you because you can't take out the trash mm -hmm. and remember to do that. I was working with, um, during COVID, uh, a college student who was living at home, and um, her parents really wanted her to do a better job with the dishes. And she's quite bright. So she fits in the TUI category, you know, which is right in your ballpark, Emily, and also in mine. And, um, and you know, she's like, why can't you just do the dishes? Why can't you just do the dishes? And she said to me, I hate doing the dishes. Like, I'll do any other chore. I'll do the litter box. I'll do the composting. I'll take the trash out. I just, I, mean, I don't really see the dishes and I hate doing them. So we talked about how to have a conversation with your parents and say, could we make a trade? <laughs> you know, I'll do this thing that actually means something to me, and, and I'll put my dishes in the sink, but, um, or I'll work with you after dinner, but I can't really do it myself. I'm just not good at it. And her parents, who are really enlightened, and one of them is a therapist, were like, okay, we'll try and see how this works. And they did, and it worked better because she actually did the things that she said she would. Yeah. That's kind of what I talk about a lot in my book and in my card deck and on my website, which is meeting kids where they are instead of where you want them to be or you think they should be. Well, and I know one of the other major influences, especially even in our house, is uh, the various needs that all of us have because of our own different flavors of neurodiversity. So, mm -hmm. you know, especially when it comes to trying to be an ADHD parent, for ADHD kids, it can get a little overwhelming, I think, on all sides. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, that's one of the topics that, that you always kind of try to address, which is how can parents 
better understand and communicate with their kids and really hear what their kids are saying. Mm -hmm. Well, in my five C's approach, I try to address this. So the first C is self-control. We as adults manage ourselves first so that we can then um, help our kids regulate, right? The second C is compassion. We try to meet our kids where they are. We try to imagine what it's like to walk, you know, five minutes in their shoes. And, um, and that compassion is also directed towards ourselves as adults because we're not perfect. And we're not going to get it right all the time. And neither are our kids. And I think today, particularly with social media, people have very high expectations for their parenting, unrealistic expectations. And there's a lot of compare and despair out there in the world of parenting um, neurodivergent kids. The third C is, is collaboration. How do you work with your child given who they are and what matters to them so they have buy-in and want to participate in what in the task that you're asking them to do or the program that you're setting up? It's a, it's a together process and so that kids can feel like there's an incentive that matters to them and that you actually also can see that they are participating in, in something that matters to you. So everybody wins. Yeah. The fourth one is consistency. So a lot of times, you know, that perfectionism, you know, rears its ugly head and we expect um, ourselves to do it right all the time. We expect our kids to be able to follow through or complete tasks more often than not, more often than they might be capable of given their working memory challenges or their processing speed. Um, so we want to look for, you know, um, what I call efforting. You know, we want to notice that. And then we also want to pay attention to um, when things are making progress. They're not necessarily perfect, but that, you know, practice makes progress. Mm -hmm. And then the last C is celebration. And that is actually really important. And this comes from positive psychology, which is noticing what's going well. You know, kids with ADHD hear a lot about how they're missing the mark, what they're not getting, what they're doing wrong. And Dr. Barbara Fredrickson and her colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania in the, around 2010 did a lot of research. And they found that the ideal positive ratio in all areas of life is three to one three positives for every negative. That's not what most kids are experiencing. They're experiencing for anywhere from 10, if you ask some kids, 30 or 40 negatives per day. So we really want to acknowledge, affirm, notice when things are going well. We don't want to bake a cake because your kid cleared the table, but we want to say, hi, uh, you know, give them a high five and say, thanks for clearing your plate. I love when you do that. Yeah, I, I noticed. Exactly. More in a minute. The Bell and Blank Center is a leader in talent development for students from elementary through university. Their Academy for Twice Exceptionality and their Assessment and Counseling Clinic feature leading psychoeducational assessment, counseling services, resources, and consultation for parents and their children from preschool all the way through college. One of the best options for neurodivergent students is early entrance, and the Buxbaum Early Entrance Academy at Bell & Blank is known around the globe as one of the best options for helping your child get an early head start on their education. Buxbaum enables high school juniors and seniors who are ready for university-level work to skip their final years of high school and head straight to college. The Bell & Blank Center's Academy for Twice Exceptionality helps our neurodivergent college students to foster meaningful academic experiences and develop independence, social-emotional maturity, communication skills, and career readiness. The Bell & Blank Center at bellandblank.org. That's B-E-L-I-N-B-L-A-N-K dot org. Or look for a link in the show notes. I know that this is a topic that you think a lot about and talk a lot about is ADHD and anxiety, mm -hmm. because I think so often those two things go hand in hand, even if we aren't necessarily talking about clinical anxiety. What are your thoughts about the connection between those two pieces? It's a great question. Thank you. According to the statistics and the research, about 34% of kids with ADHD have co-occurring anxiety. That is clinically diagnosed. Personally, in my practice, and probably in yours, and for everybody who's listening, you see this more often. A child or a teen 
or an adult may not meet the the criteria to have a, a, a diagnosis, but they may still live with a lot of anxiety. And actually, the statistics for adults with anxiety with ADHD are even higher, closer to 50%. Yeah. That's something that is, is it's important for us to really take a few minutes, just as you've suggested, and explore that. One of the things that I think happens um, with ADHD and anxiety is that people with ADHD are a little more hypervigilant about themselves and about things in the world. And some of that comes from that negative feedback that uh, that kids get early on about missing the mark when they're not even sure what they did, about saying something inappropriate when they didn't know it was it was not the strong choice, um, about maybe tripping or having um, a speech impediment or stuttering or whatever it is. And so what happens is over time, the kids start to develop, um, a nervousness about themselves, which can then develop into anxiety. Like, when is the next time that I'm going to mess up that I didn't even know I was doing? Or when is the next time that something bad is going to happen? Because it always does. And so this then develops, you know, general anxiety. And then over time, what we see is a, is a, is a transition sometimes into panic um, into social anxiety, uh, and of course, the, the, the everyday concerns about, you know, am I safe? Am I going to feel okay? Uh, is it secure? And so um, these, are, these are things that we see. We also see perfectionism, which is a sort of a manifestation of anxiety, and of course, procrastination, which is also a manifestation of anxiety, because if you follow it along the line, it's like, oh, you know, am I going to be able to do this? I haven't done this in the past. What makes me think I'm going to do it this time? Pfft, forget it. I think one of the things that's interesting, too, is that once those patterns are there, even if you're working on the ADHD and the executive function skills, and even if you try medication and the medication is really effective, I think it's really hard to then unlearn those patterns of anxiety. The executive function stuff maybe is almost a little bit easier to quote unquote fix. I don't think that's really the right word, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But once those beliefs are there, once those worries are there, once that hypervigilance is there, it's just hard to escape that. It is. And, you know, there is a, a, a genetic sort of susceptibility to anxiety. You know, a anxious parents have anxious kids um, and anxious kids may have anxious parents. There, It's not so much a predisposition as it is um, with, with depression, but it is a, a kind of proclivity that we see that anxiety often runs in families. And of course, because many people with ADHD struggle with emotional regulation. So what happens is you have a little un uncertainty. And because it's difficult for you to manage the intensity of your emotions when you have ADHD, that little bit of uncertainty or insecurity can feel like a tidal wave in certain situations, and then you're just struggling to keep your head above water. And so what happens is that a lot of times adults and well-intentioned parents try to reassure their kids. Um, and really what kids need is validation rather than reassurance, because you as their parent, you can't be there all the time to let them know it's going to work out. And frankly, you don't know that it's going to work out. What we want to do instead is to validate, yes, you know what? It makes sense that you're afraid on the first day of school. Lots of kids are. You're not sure who your teacher is or what it's going to be like to be in this class. I get it. Instead of don't worry, you'll be fine. It always works out. So it's a tough, it's a tough dance for us because, yes, we want to love them up and help them believe in themselves. And the way that we want to do that is to actually be the memory bank of past successes times when they overcame anxiety that we could bring into this situation so that they understand that, that they have the capacity in them to get through this, even though it is a little scary. You know, another area that is always very interesting for me and, and that I have a lot of curiosity about is kind of sorting through ADHD and autism, mm. because I think that's another place where we have a lot of overlap there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because... Well, you can get online on Pick Your Social Media site and find all sorts of theories and ideas <laughs> and, and self-diagnosis tips for each of these things, right. you know, in varying degrees of, of accuracy. But can you talk a little bit just about 
what the differences are, what it kind of looks like when they're layered, you know, and just maybe kind of trying to tease out where the executive functioning difficulties that go along with autism are compared to with ADHD. So everybody with ADHD has more executive functioning deficits or several really impactful executive functioning deficits that impact their daily living skills. Yeah. Part of having ADHD means having these executive functioning challenges, severe challenges in some areas. And that's not necessarily the case with autism. So the diff- some of the differences for me with ADHD is that kids with ADHD understand, for the most part, the rules of social engagement. Um, they may not follow them, <laughs> but they understand them. And kids with autism often don't understand the rules of social en- engagement uh, particularly well, and they mis- they miscues. So kids with ADHD miscues because they're distracted. Um, Kids with uh, autism miscues because they can't read them or it's too much information coming at them. So your facial information is too much for me to process at one time. So I need to look, you know, at your hairline here. Uh, That's a skill that I've I've learned, you know, from my counselor, Emily, who is so great. Whereas kids with ADHD, um, they get overwhelmed, but they're, and they're overwhelmed by a lot of uh, information, both sensory and uh, auditory and visual. And they share that with kids with autism, but, you know, the, the process of that is somewhat different. I think it's worth noting that about 50% of kids uh, whose primary diagnosis is autism also have a co-occurring ADHD diagnosis, but only about 14% of kids whose primary diagnosis is ADHD have a coexisting um, autism diagnosis. So it's actually kind of different. And there has been some research um, that shows that if you um, have a child or a teen who um, is diagnosed with autism, has some of the signs, but may even may not meet the full criteria for ADHD, and you uh, use ADHD medication with them, that it will actually uh, target both the s- some of the symptoms of autism and ADHD simultaneously, which is interesting to think about. I know that there's so much stigma surrounding medication as well. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you notice benefits with your clients who use ADHD medication. Yes, and I also have clients who can't use it. Yeah, like they've they've tried a couple different things and then they just say no, we're done. Um, it's a very frightening thing to give medication to a child mm-hmm. uh, for a parent. Um, I'm a parent. You're a parent. Uh, I think it, it would be scary. Um, and so what we see a lot is that in elementary school, parents are much more reluctant, unless behaviors are extreme, to use medication. But by the time kids sort of get to secondary school, whether it's middle school or high school, and they're really struggling, both the kids and the parents themselves are much more willing to try anything at this point because they want to have friends, they want to be able to change classes, they want a locker that doesn't have papers, fl- you know, <laughs> flying out when you open it. They want to be able to, you know, have talked to people at lunch. Yeah. There is sort of this pattern um, that I see quite a bit. What about emotional regulation with ADHD? Because I feel like that's one of the things that is obviously, to me, a major part of ADHD, but sometimes kind of gets, it doesn't really get ignored, but people don't always realize it is part of the ADHD. Like, do you have any ideas about, like, what's causing that within the ADHD? To me, sometimes it looks like impulsiveness and and just those big emotions, but I'm curious if you have any insights to that as well. Uh, You know, I would agree with you on that. I think that there is impulse control. There's verbal impulse control and there's behavioral impulse control. And and the thing that happens with these emotions, particularly anxiety, is that our body has a stress response. So our body, and, and particularly for ADHD brains, kicks in very quickly to the fight, flight, or freeze modality. And so that amygdala is it, the, the loop is is very, it's just very reactive. And so what we see is that it's hard for a lot of kids with ADHD to um, slow down. 
I don't like the term calm down because I don't know about you, Emily, but when someone tells me I need to calm down, I'm just like, get away from me. It's going to escalate everything. <laughs> it's going to escalate everything. Exactly. But slow down actually is something I could I could personally relate to and my clients relate to it. Um, you know, and how do we slow down? So I talk about this, you know, a lot in my cards or my book or whatever, my website. Basically, stop, think, act, and recover. In fact, I've, I've, I've actually changed it in my book. It's just stop, think, act. But since I wrote my book, I've noticed, oh, wait, there's a recovery time. Oh, wait, there's a teaching time. So it's really like start. And so I think about starting uh, something different. You're pivoting. And you're going to stop. You're going to call a pause in the action. Because you yourself may need to calm down and your kids, I said calm down, but slow down. Yeah. That's because I said it about myself, you know, (laughs) different. And your child may need to slow down. So what are some activities that are okay to do in that pause moment? And that pause moment might be, I want to sit on the couch with you and have you read me a story when the last thing you as a parent want to do is that, you know, it might be a hug. It might be, I'm going to go play with our bunny you know, whatever it is, and you can go into the bathroom and wash your face and look in the mirror and say, I know I can do this. I'm just having a hard time or text a friend or a parent or your partner. Yeah. So we have that stop. We call that pause in the action. And and I think that's particularly hard in school because people don't call pause in the action. You're just expected to move on over and over again. And kids, particularly neurodivergent kids, they need time to integrate and regroup because when you're in overwhelm, your system is in, you're in a stress response. You're highly activated and it's not like you can switch to something slower. You know, pe- for people who use, use the zones of regulation, you can't go from red to green. You're going to go red, then maybe a little orange, then maybe a little yellow, then maybe a little lime green, and then maybe forest green. Right, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a process. It's a process. So, um, and then we have um, think, and think is when you come together and you actually use your best reflective listening skills, and you say, "Well, what do you think was going on? What would you have liked to have seen be different? Where do you think we are? We should go from here. What's our next right step?" And then we take that next right step action, and then we let things recover. We do not talk about what happened. We do not use a teaching moment because we're still too close to the red zone. So we're going to just recover later, maybe three hours later or the next day uh, when you're driving in the car, you might be able to say, you know, yesterday when this thing happened, I'm just wondering if maybe next time uh, we could try something different and then talk about what that might be. But you, you need space between the recovery, and the teaching. So I've sort of shifted that to be from STA, STA, to start. (laughs) Yeah, I like it. I like it. Well, I know you've given so many good ideas that parents can really use, and I know that I could could definitely sit here and talk to you all day. But as we wrap up in the essence of time, I have one last question for you. So Mm. if you were talking to a parent who is in the throes of trying to help their ADHD child but is just really struggling... What would you say to them? Like, what is it that you would want them to hear? Such a good question. I would want to to say to them, take a deep breath and zoom out. This is this is a long journey, you know. And what your child mostly needs from you is attunement, acknowledgement, and noticing, as well as appropriate boundaries. You care for yourself, and you care for them. I've been doing this for a long time, Emily, and I will tell you that I've had the privilege of working with people when they were six, seven, and eight, and then having them come back in my office at 28 and see how they've actually created a life for themselves. I'm working with someone now, and she um, tried to go to college. It didn't really work out. She took some continuing ed courses on programming and worked with her father who does um, cabinet making for a while and just applied for a job with a company who said, we want to take a chance on you. And, you know, got a job for like $75,000 a year. And they said, and we also want to pay for you to take 
uh, one or two courses so it per per year, per semester or year so that you can get your bachelor's. I mean, you know, you just don't know where things are going to turn out. And I think when you're in the thick of struggling, all you see is, oh my God, my child is never going to mature into a self-sufficient adult. And and I will say from my seat that I have yet to see someone who doesn't mature into a self-sufficient adult, um, with the one exception of kids who, um, to be honest, uh, um, become overuse marijuana or any other sort of substance. But even those kids often get treatment and they they kind of rebuild. There's a fundamental resiliency here. So be kind to yourself as a parent and be accepting of your kids where they are and, and remembering that, it, that there's a, a developmental lag for kids with ADHD uh, in terms of brain maturity. And that has to do with um, the connectivity that we call myelination um, between uh, the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain. And of uh, there's a lag of about three years. So you may have a 10-year-old who may very well sometimes act like they're seven, and that is actually okay and, and very common and to be expected um, in certain areas. I know you said one thing, but it's so complicated. I know. It's a lot. It's a lot. Well, and, and I think any words of encouragement are good, you know. And so uh, Dr. Sharon Celine, author of What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you so much for having me, Emily. It's been a great pleasure. I think ADHD suffers from being the type of neurodiversity that people think they understand, but really don't. ADHD has been part of the conversation between parents, doctors, and teachers for decades. But even still, the characteristics associated with it are attributed to personality flaws, It's minimized by people who claim that every moment of distraction is part of ADHD or who claim that ADHD can't exist because don't we all get a little distracted or procrastinate sometimes? ADHDers are constantly trying to prove that they need supports. If you're a parent or a teacher of an ADHDer or you are an ADHDer yourself, just know that I see you. And together we'll keep doing the work to build awareness, acceptance, an understanding of ADHD. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Our thanks to Dr. Sharon Celine. Find links to her work, website, and social media on the episode page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Thanks to the first official sponsor of our podcast, the Bell and Blank Center at the University of Iowa. They've been longtime believers in the podcast, and we appreciate them helping to make it possible now. Visit them at bellandblank.org. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. The social media specialist and production assistant is Krista Brown. The executive producer and studio engineer is me, Dave Morris. For all of us here, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.